So we're going to uh, start with the panel. And I'm just going to say that the panels have done a really beautiful job. So we're just going to start with that. This is our um, early journey elementary year panel. And um, I, I think the panelists need very little introduction except to remind um, our federal agency partners of some of the work that we in the Duchenne community have done previously to impact the diagnostic odyssey in Duchenne. Um, we've worked with our federal partners at the CDC and other places to shorten that diagnostic odyssey. And we do have data through our MD StarNet surveillance that shows that the time period between when a parent first expresses a concern to their provider and when there's a confirmed diagnosis in Duchenne is on average two to five years. And we then partnered with the CDC years ago to develop diagnostic tools and training tools for primary care providers and push those out through the American Academy of Pediatrics and other primary care provider organizations to try and impact that and shorten that journey because we all know that that's not necessary and that there are easier ways through CKs and other ways to really identify individuals and young children with Duchenne. And in listen, I just want to point out the ages of these children, that each of the children, the parents of these children, were diagnosed since the time that we've done that work. And so we are working on newborn screening and other ways to um, identify and work with our partners on um, ensuring that the therapies that are being developed and the um, therapeutic tools that are being developed get to our families as soon as possible. Um, but the families here today are really going to, I think, raise some really important issues that we as a community are very committed to. So I just want to highlight some of that as we listen to their testimony. So we're going to start with Jessica Curran. And um, Jess, you just take it away. Hello. My name is Jessica Curran, and I live in Ridgefield, Connecticut, with my loving husband, Chris, and my three sons, Connor, Kyle, and William. I'm a first grade teacher in Patterson, New York. Connor is my firstborn son. He was born a twin, but he was very much his own person from the start. He was born happy and healthy. As any parent would, I pictured my life and what it would look like. While I thought about his future, I was also very much present. Being a mom was all I ever wanted. Nothing could ever prepare you for Duchenne. When Connor was four years old, we noticed that he wasn't able to keep up with his peers or his brothers. We took him to a doctor in hopes to get some answers, maybe. We waited a dreaded four weeks to get some answers from genetic testing that was performed. And when they could not confirm DMD, they proceeded to test further. Another four weeks went by. Waiting was so hard, but it was also the unknown that was better than knowing at the time. The genetic doctor said there was no hope, no cure, and he handed me a thick packet on DMD. We were told to do things as a family now while Connor is still walking. I died that day and my hopes and dreams for Connor died too. Connor takes lots of pills. He takes steroids to build his stamina so that he can last a full day at school. He takes pills for digestion, vitamin deficiency, to keep his bones strong. And he wants to know why he's taking all these pills when they really don't work. He wears uncomfortable night braces every single night. He goes to various therapies and he weekly misses school on a weekly basis for appointments. This is our new normal. He has trouble walking and he has leg pain. At some point every day, Connor feels fatigued, exhausted, embarrassed, sad, and angry. He falls over nothing, and he gets bumps on his head like a toddler learning to walk. He cannot use the stairs in our home or on the bus and has to be carried like a baby. We recently installed chairlifts into our home. I quietly sobbed as the men measured and installed them in my home. I felt the need to explain to them. You see, I told the workers, these lifts are for my seven-year-old son. His muscles are wasting away. He has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. The men looked at me and didn't know what to say. 
as most people do. What boy does not want to run up the stairs, grab a snack, greet a guest, or use the bathroom? Instead, he calls my name for help, and I find him crawling up with all his might. I know that Connor wants to be independent at seven. And his peers innocently ask why Connor's muscles don't work and why he can't run or go to gym, everyone's favorite special. Why does Connor stand around at recess and watch the other boys and girls play? For our family, living with DMD means constant worry, advocating tirelessly here in DC, spreading awareness, and raising funds for research. It also means traveling far to visit the right doctor, putting our son through more blood work, MRIs, time function tests over and over again. We constantly search for the right clinical trials in hopes for a chance to extend Connor's life. We try to make the right decisions for Connor's care while thinking about our other two children that we'll have to leave behind for days each month while being part of a trial. And their bro Connor's brothers ask, are you leaving again to try to help Connor's muscles? The emotional sideshows in our house occur on a daily basis and are heart-wrenching. Last year, we traveled to Florida every month for a week at a time so that Connor can participate in a trial. On one end, we felt lucky to be part of it, but at the same time, we were unsure it was even working in his body. Making these decisions are tough because sometimes something always has to give. Leaving behind your family, putting your child through poking and prodding and wondering all along if you made the right decision. When you know better, you do better. We decided once we made our decision to be part of a trial, we stuck with it without regret. We dropped out to try for a different trial that we thought might be better, but we really didn't know. Living with DMD also means keeping a smile on your face while the doctors are talking with your child in the same room, watching you and trusting you. Duchenne seeps into your home, your family, every member of your family, your immediate and your extended, feel the pain. It seeps into your work, your friendships, and your marriage. It enters and tries to seek and destroy all the things that matter the most to you, especially your sweet, innocent child. We try to see every day as a gift. We live in the moment, and I know that the Lord has Connor in the palm of his hand, and for this, I'm grateful. Next, we have thank you, Jess. Next, we have Colleen Labadia. Yes, I'm sorry, I seated you in the wrong order. Oh no, I'm blessed to Lisa. Okay. That's how the camera wants it. Sorry, Lisa Rhodes. Okay. Um, my name is Lisa Rhodes. I'm from Utica, Nebraska, where I'm wife to my husband Wes. Um, I'm a stay-at-home mom of three. Prior to having children, I was a full-time physical therapist assistant. Lane is six, and he has Duchenne. He's not on steroids or any other medications at this time. Olivia is four, and Wyatt is three, and Wyatt does not have Duchenne. I'm a carrier with no family history. I first started noticing the symptoms of Duchenne in January 2014, just after Lane's second birthday. In June, we had requested therapies for Lane from our local primary provider for speech delays as well as gross and fine motor delays. After doing some research, I had also requested a CK blood draw, and I will never forget that phone call when the results were reported back. The nurse who called me actually asked me if he should be hospitalized. It was in that moment during the diagnostic call from the nurse that I began, I began educating others about Duchenne. August 19, 2014, is the day that Lane was officially diagnosed with Duchenne. Once we had the diagnosis, I did my own research to find the right doctors for our team. We travel out of state to a clinic that's eight hours away. We found an in-state pulmonologist and cardiologist who are also willing to follow Lane, and our local primary care physician is great to work with. 
Lane has physical therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech services both through the school and privately once a week. Lane has several delays. At six years old, he does not know his ABCs, and he struggles to count to 10. It is a challenge to get him to participate in activities if he isn't interested in them. And these are all directly related to having Duchenne. We have looked into participating in clinical trials, but this is extremely difficult to plan when our family is so young. Since I stay home, we don't really have a regular daycare provider for our other two children. Some of the trials that we are interested in only have trial sites located across the country. And if we move to be closer to the trial sites, we would then be away from our community and our family supports. So we feel that that is not a good option for our family. Aside from the physical limitations of Duchenne, behaviors can be a challenge if things don't go just the right way for Lane. Behavioral challenges are an important component in Duchenne, but they are often not talked about much. Even simple things like a favorite TV show not being on at the usual time can send him into a meltdown where he might throw things, knock things over, and he yells and he cries. These meltdowns can last for 10 minutes, and then after the 10 minutes, it's like a switch is flipped, and it's as though it never happened, and he's back to being his happy self. We have gone to counseling, too, to try and learn ways to help our family cope with these episodes, which just adds another appointment to the list of appointments that we already have. Duchenne truly impacts every single aspect of our family's lives. The house that we live in, the cars we drive, the way we participate in activities, the activities that we choose to participate in. And it impacts every single of those aspects except for one. And that's how much we deeply love our blue-eyed boy. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> Next, we have Nate Plasman. Hi, my name is Nate Plasman. Uh, my wife, Sarah, who's here in the audience, and I, along with our three children, Grace, age nine, Jackson, age five, and Andrew, age three and three quarter, reside in suburban Chicago. Andrew Jean Plasman was born on Tuesday, July 1st, 2014, at 2.21 p.m. He weighed eight pounds, five ounces. He followed the growth chart and developed as expected. However, he missed a few milestones along the way. He was floppy and clumsy and very content to sit and play. In January 2016, Andrew turned 18 months. He wasn't yet walking, so our pediatrician recommended Andrew as a candidate for physical therapy. Sarah took immediate action and scheduled the necessary appointments. The resulting evaluations confirmed Sarah's observations and thus began in-home weekly sessions of physical therapy and speech therapy. Six months of therapy produced noticeable improvements. On Friday, July 1st, 2016, Andrew was evaluated at a standard two-year checkup appointment with our family pediatrician. However, our, our regularly uh, seen pediatrician was on maternity leave, so Andrew met with a new physician. During the visit, Sarah voiced her concerns and mentioned how she had asked Andrew's phys physical therapist if we should be concerned about muscular dystrophy. The physician observed Andrew's movements and ordered a CK test. That evening, we celebrated Andrew's second birthday. One of Andrew's presents was a toddler-sized battery-powered four-wheeler. And of course, assembly was required. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> soon thereafter, we ventured outside for a test drive of his new toy. I distinctly remember how Andrew struggled. Thanks. He struggled to operate the four-wheeler. He was surprisingly uneasy and didn't, have to have the, didn't seem to have the core strength to balance himself on the seat and engage the hand grip throttle controls. I vividly recall growing impatient, frustrated, and angry 
<clears throat> I dismissed the struggle as fatigue from a long day with doctor appointments and a blood draw. He'll do better after a good night of rest, I thought, so off to bed we went. The next morning, we traveled to Holland, Michigan for a long holiday weekend. Just five miles from our destination, Sarah's phone rang. The pediatrician's personal phone number appeared on caller ID. Sarah nervously answered the call. Andrew's CK test came back with a reading of 24,000. <laughs> Complete mayhem ensued. At that very moment, everything changed, but nothing changed. Yeah. Equipped with Andrew's CK test results, Sarah immediately became gravely concerned about her son Jackson's health. Jackson had just finished the spring soccer season on a Park District soccer team. He was uninterested and dreaded running at practices and in games. This coupled with the fact that as a newborn infant, Jackson had been hospitalized with elevated liver enzymes and required liver biopsy. We contemplated the frightening possibility that both our boys could have Duchenne. A pediatric neurology appointment at Lurie Children's Hospital was scheduled for July 13. We immediately appreciated the physician's gentle approach, and we knew we were in the right place. It was a relatively brief visit. She ordered a genetic test for Andrew, and she encouraged us to schedule a CK test for Jackson. So 48 hours later, on July 15, 2016, I brought Jackson for a CK test on my lunch break. He sat on my lap and whimpered. As they poked his face. Jackson was strong and courageous. Upon leaving, I notified our pediatrician of the successful blood draw and asked for the results as soon as they were available. I returned to work and closed the door and window treatments in my office. I turned off the lights and sat frozen with fear and anxiety for the next four hours. Then right before 5 p.m., my phone rang. Once again, it was the pediatrician's personal cell phone number that appeared on the caller ID. I nervously answered the call and trembled as I heard her voice. Nate? Nate, is this you? Congratulations, Nate. Jackson scored a 384 on his CK test. I rushed home. We celebrated the results and cried tears of joy. Steroid administration has been brutal. Andrew initially refused to cooperate with the twice-weekly dosage. So on Saturday and Sunday mornings, uh, we've had to pin him, to the do pin him down on the floor, uh, plug his nose, and force the medicine down his little throat. As difficult as it was, we noticed a significant improvement in Andrew's strength, his stamina, and mobility. He, fell less, he falls less often. And now more stable on his feet, Andrew has become more confident, assertive, engaging, and naughty. <laughs> We've returned to Lurie four additional times uh, for clinic visits and evaluations. We are grateful to have such a supportive medical, medical team an award-winning award -winning children's hospital just 20 miles from our house. Andrew is a brave and joyful boy. He is thriving as a student in a local early childhood program. He loves his teachers and his classmates. While at school, he receives regular physical and occupational therapy. He loves his big sister and brother. He mimics their movements, repeats their words, and follows their example. He loves to run and wants to race everyone, regardless of the fact that he loses every time. Uh, he loves to wrestle on the floor, and of course, we have to do this with our shirts off. He insists. He also enjoys weekly aqua therapy and is fearless in the pool. However, Andrew struggles on stairs, steps, bleachers, and any uneven ground. Getting on and off the toilet is difficult. Getting in and out of our minivan is challenging. Getting dressed or undressed presents issues. To combat these things, he wears SMOs with his shoes. They provide increased stability. He wears AFOs, or as we, we refer to them, superhero boots to bed. Before bedtime, Sarah faithfully stretches and massages his legs. We hope to enroll Andrew in gene therapy clinical trials as soon as he meets the age and or weight requirements. Our love and commitment for our precious son positions us to rule nothing out. 
to explore any and all potential clinical trials. Therefore, we are willing to take on the associated risks, logistical challenges, and necessary sacrifice. We acknowledge that Andrew belongs to his creator. As his earthly parents, we desire to do everything within our control to advocate on his behalf and provide him with a long, joyful, meaningful life. We are grateful for the responsibility we've been entrusted to steward Andrew's life as best we can and to prepare him for life as an independent adult. Andrew's diagnosis has forced our family to live in the moment, day by day by day. By staying in the present and not getting ahead of ourselves, it has brought us closer and made us stronger. Thank you, Nate. Colleen. Good job. Thanks. My name is Colleen Lavadia. My husband, Chris, and I have made our home in Central Florida with our three children, Kate, Brendan, and Nolan. It was our middle son, Brendan, his walking delays at 15 months that introduced us to the world, Duchenne, and changed the course of our lives. After months of physical therapy with very little progress, Brendan saw his first local no neurologist after my insistence. However, after six months, two additional local neurology visits and still no diagnostic answer, we sought help at Boston Children's Hospital, certain that Harvard Medical School could give us an answer, and they did. Three weeks after our initial visit, they confirmed that Brendan had Duchenne. I really wish Duchenne wasn't something that we had to face each day, but unfortunately, it's always there. It's always there. Even in the midst of the fun and beautiful moments, Duchenne reminds us of its presence. It most notably comes to us during mundane tasks, like long distance walks, or climbing numerous flights of stairs, or just recreational pickup sports games. Brendan's ability within each of these areas is compromised. Although he can still perform each, he finds difficulty in doing so. Living in Florida, we take frequent trips to Disney World and the beaches. All day walking around a theme park takes its toll on Brendan and his body. He becomes really tired, and at seven years old, we cannot make park visits without a stroller. The uneven sandy surfaces of the beach are an obstacle in and of itself and cause numerous falls. This involves a lot of me carrying him around the beach and trying to find sandbars that are flat for his steady walking. Sadly, each of these ventures start out magical, but tend to end up in tears as a fall or tired legs interrupt or stop our day. Brendan's best days are those when he feels like his peers. Those are the days when he participates fully at recess and doesn't endure a lot of falls. And I believe this is because a lot of the adaptation that Brendan makes each day. He is constantly evaluating his surroundings and making adjustments for his little body. For instance, he takes the role of the coach or on the defensive side of things at games because there's less running. But he's always eager to find a way to participate. He's seven. Brendan also recognizes his abilities and inabilities and will seek a ramp or incline or walk around if he has to step up. He is sadly in tune and avoids hardships when possible. And this is so bittersweet to watch. But again, Duchenne is always there. Some of Brendan's worst days involve those in which he recognizes and feels his limitations, especially relating to his Duchenne jog, you know, a slow-paced little trot, something that lacks speed, but it's the fastest that he can move. His inability to jump and extended time rising from the floor. These days are further made difficult by Brendan's emotional vulnerability and the questions he presents us about Duchenne. He asks us why his body is the way it is, which gets difficult to answer because I'm not a carrier. He has inquired as to why he's not the same as his two siblings. He wants to know when he can stop taking medicine. And most notably, he's asked us if Jesus can heal him the way he's healed others. These inquiries are crushing. And we provide age-appropriate answers and, and do our best to keep him hopeful and optimistic. But these bad days unquestionably prove to become our worst days as well. But 
These bad days have also fueled us to research and advocate and select the best possible therapeutic choices for our brave little guy. But like everything else Duchenne related, making a selection hasn't been easy. And mainly that's because of Brendan's complicated medical history. He was born with bilateral club feet and also has a growth hormone deficiency. And um, these are all alongside Duchenne. And that's complicated our decision-making process at times. But thankfully, with the solid support system of doctors and PPMD, that's helped us. And we selected um, a steroid alternative treatment for Brendan for now. Duchenne is hard. Every single aspect of it. And on every single member of our family. I relish in my kids' accomplishments daily. But my heart simultaneously breaks. as I grieve for their projected futures, all of them. It's an emotional struggle every day. I despise that Duchenne splits or overloads our family some days with demanding appointments. I weep when activities are missed because Duchenne cuts in. But I cry happy tears when my two other children sit alongside Brendan and create their own stretches at night. I love when they make adjustments impulsively to their play to accommodate their brother or they create a new game that allows Brendan to showcase his strengths. Duchenne doesn't provide an easy life, and the impact on all of us is real. It's easy to get swallowed up by these negative aspects, sure, but we choose to see the light, we choose to enjoy each day, and we choose to fight for the best this lifetime has to offer our entire community. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Claire? Good morning. I'm honored to be part of this panel today. My name is Claire Daimler, and I'm from St. Louis. I live there with my husband, Chris, and our two kids, Henry and Lucy, who turn 11 and 8 next week. Thank you for your time and this opportunity to share part of our story. On Friday, December 30th, 2011, we were getting ready for a family Christmas party when I received a call from our pediatrician's office. Earlier that week, the doctor had ordered blood tests after Henry's teacher had requested a PT referral. Although I had raised concerns in the past about his inability to jump or climb, I was always assured that kids develop at different stages. Over the phone, the doctor shared that lab results indicated Duchenne muscular dystrophy. As my mind scrambled to recall what I knew of Duchenne, he said, it was bad and told me that I would find more online. Our vacationing pediatrician would refer us to a neurologist after the long holiday weekend. My happy babies went to the party with my sister while our world crumbled into pieces. My husband and I wept at the prognosis that we found on Wikipedia. This dark night marks the before and after of our family's life. How can I convey to you the weight of every decision that we make for our family? The fear of making a misstep with clinical trials. The strain of trying to bring every bit of joy out of life. The heaviness of trying to do our best, fearing that time is not on our side. My children cannot remember a time before Duchenne. In their world, Henry has always done stretches every night, worn night splints, and used a wheelchair so that he could save his muscles for the fun stuff. They have become accustomed to frequent clinic visits to Cincinnati, and Henry has grown to tolerate weekly infusions and blood draws. We hope these efforts that take so much time away from childhood make a difference in his quality of life. As the years pass, though, Duchenne becomes a more painful and difficult companion to accommodate. In the past year, the tragedy of Duchenne has begun to dawn on Henry. After his first visit to MDA camp this past summer, I gently corrected him. He didn't think anyone in his cabin had Duchenne because everyone was in a wheelchair permanently or was too tall to be on daily steroids. He has started to see that other boys are no longer walking or able to hold a spoon or to scratch their noses. 
He worries that he will be bullied next year in middle school for being short. He's sad that he can't play sports with his friends. And he cries because he worries that he won't be able to have a job when he is older. My happy boy grows sadder and angrier as his friends become bigger and stronger. Henry wonders where he fits. Yet here we are, the parents of a fifth grader who walked into school last week, something I did not dare to hope when he was diagnosed in preschool. The dichotomy of Duchenne can be difficult to reconcile. As parents, we are forced to see the bigger picture while Duchenne bring time, brings time into laser focus. We try to pack all the experiences of life into the short years that we might have together while hoping that Henry will outlive us with his own family. While my children sleep, we burn hours researching, connecting, and finding ways to change the outcome. We plan for the inevitable, inevitable and fight for a miracle. Henry deserves the opportunity to make his dreams come true, to become an engineer or a game developer or a dad. As parents, we are exhausting every option as friends and family surround us with support and love. Henry's doctors in Cincinnati and St. Louis and around the world, along with PPMD and other patient groups are relentless in their commitment. I urge you to support policies that bring treatments to market and to take action to save our sons. Help us change the outcome. Help us end Duchenne. All right, and let's thank the panel for their really amazing testimony. <laughs> Okay, we, we're gonna do some polling. Um, and we're gonna, this, now we're gonna um, open the conversation up for the community, everybody in the room who has a child who is 10 and under is invited to participate in this polling and then in the discussion that we're going to have following the polling. So Ryan's gonna come up and facilitate the polling, okay? So I think my first job is to keep it together after um, hearing those wonderful testimonies. Um, as Annie laid out, the next set will be for those with children um, 10 years or younger to answer these questions. So I think we can have the um, first set of polling questions up. Up. Okay, symptoms, yes. So here we're looking at for you to choose the top three symptoms that have the biggest impact on your child's day-to-day -day life. And obviously, many of these symptoms would, appl would apply to your children, but which ones do you feel have the biggest impact right now, okay? We're seeing high numbers in the fatigue category. Answers are still coming in. Behavior. Tightness. So by far, the fatigue and feeling fi uh, tired is, is rating the highest among these choices, followed be by uh, behavior issues. Of course, difficulty walking. And then frequent falls and uh, muscle cramps are leveling out here, so hopefully those online are having no issues doing the polling. So I think we can actually move on to the next question. Okay. So for this, we're, these are children 10 years or younger. If a new treatment could help your child, which activities would be most important to preserve or maintain right now? And I want you to choose three. So these are really activities of daily living. We're seeing get up off the floor, walk for a longer time. I'm gonna let these just come in so we have a more accurate tallery of the, the top choices. So choosing the, 
top three for those with a child 10 years or younger. Walk for a longer time. Walk upstairs. And get up off the floor. Which we really know does correspond to a lot of these outcome measures and tests that we're doing as well. Huh? I need to talk louder? Me from Long Island? I need, okay. So I didn't want to blow you out the water, but I will talk louder. Um, okay, so walk for a longer time seems to be the highest, um, uh, walk, followed by walk upstairs and then get up off the floor. Can we have the next question, please? Okay, so this is a very similar question, but the responses are a bit different. We're asking children 10 years or younger if a new treatment could uh, uh, help your child um, right now, which would be the most important, and these are more global health measures. So please choose three from the list. We're seeing again more energy to be very important. Stronger heart. Let these take a minute to come in. Okay, so more energy is ranking. Um, higher and this sort of matches up with the um, voting for fatigue earlier on. Stronger heart, really followed by stronger bones and then others that are uh, equal in order. So, okay, I think we can move on to the next question. That's the last question? Okay. So that is the last question within this question set. I'm now gonna invite Annie up to facilitate a um, discussion with the audience, bring you back into the conversation. We did the polling, which including you and our online audience, and Annie can facilitate these questions with the audience, so. Okay, so just for the discussion, let's remember the frame of reference for the answers to these questions is when your child was 10 and under elementary years. Okay, so we want you just to either answer if that's the time period you're in or reflect back on that time for the frame of reference. Um, and so this first question is open to anybody and panel certainly participate and audience participate and we want you to raise your hand and we have Amanda, Amanda are you covering this side of the room and then Ryan is covering this side of the room we'll have someone um, bring a microphone to you and just remember please introduce yourself and then tell us where you're from and then your child's age or if you're a teen or adult participating your age okay so let's start with um, you know we've heard some from some of the testimony today a little bit about dual diagnoses or the complexity of therapeutic decision making or the diagnostic process because of there were um, other medical factors at play and we recognize that Duchenne doesn't happen in a vacuum. So can we hear from folks who may have circumstances around their child's diagnosis or since that have made treatment decisions more complex, such as diagnoses that your child with Duchenne may have other than Duchenne complicating medical factors, dual diagnoses, allergies. So we can either start with the panel or move to the floor if people would like to share. Ryan, John, up here. Thanks, Annie. Um, so I think... Um, your name? I'm, your I'm sorry, name? I'm John Killian uh, from Dallas, Texas. Uh, our son Sam is 16. Uh, but going back to early in his diagnosis, and he was also diagnosed with ADHD, um, which I think is really, really common across uh, the du du Duchenne diagnosis. And quite frankly, as a 16-year-old, adds as much difficulty to his life um, today as, as, as the, the Duchenne diagnosis. So, and how old was he when he was diagnosed? Uh, he was probably, well... He got a firm diagnosis when he was eight or nine, okay. uh, but before that, it was pretty apparent. Okay. And okay. that goes along with other things that are not diagnosed, but things like 
OCD type activity. You know, so it's not an actual OCD diagnosis, but um, uh, he has things that look like OCD, and we think that's a Duchenne-related diagnosis. So. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Over, I see over here. Um, I'm Karen Birch from Buffalo, New York. My grandson is also diagnosed with idiopathic angioedema. So out of the clear blue, his lips will just swell. And that impacts his ability for study participation because angioedema can be considered uh, life endangering mm -hmm. consequence, and you don't want that on your study drug. Uh, he also has issues with myositis that haven't quite been resolved. He just, he hasn't had it in a while. It was more when he was younger, and that, the myositis issues is what first got us uh, the diagnosis of Duchenne because he was hospitalized at like 18 months or something like that uh, for the myositis. And as a result of that, we got the diagnosis of Duchenne. So th th those have impacted greatly. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Others in the room on the panel? Okay. Um, my son is Zach, and he is five going on six. And um, he has a diagnosis of autism, which is very common in our community. And how it has impacted our lives is that it was very difficult to get a diagnosis of Duchenne because he can't speak. Um, and many of the symptoms were being, I don't know, confused with autism. So his inabilities to walk upstairs. Um, we had a lot of doctors saying he has some coordination issues. And so it took maybe nine or 10 doctor visits for him to get a diagnosis. So this, this also impacts us in terms of the prospects of doing any clinical trials because he can't speak for himself. So it's very important um, for, for us as a family to support others, other families who can participate in clinical trials. Mm. That's great, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, up here, Mindy, can we, and Amanda, if you can make your way up here also then when you're done. Okay, Leandra. Hi, my name is Leandra Archdeacon. Please excuse me, I lost my voice. Um, my son is 11, and uh, from the time he was three months old, um, it, our diagnosis kicked off. He was diagnosed, he had RSV. Um, his initial diagnosis was beta thalassemia intermedia, um, and that led to Duchenne Gilbert's um, autism spectrum disorder, OCD, ADHD, and the list goes on. Um, it complicates even the screening process for clinical trials. Initially, it looks great on paper. Then when you get in and they do their labs, I mean, and, and this is very current for us. This is right now happening. They look at his labs and they're like, holy smokes, what's going on? Um, so every trial that we've tried to even look at he, he doesn't qualify for because of the multiple diagnosis. Behavior plays a big fact. It's just, it's multi-layered. It's difficult. It's hard. It makes every aspect that much harder because it's not just Duchenne. Then it's behavior. Then it's the labs. Then it's, you know, the blood disorder. And you're looking like, what, what do you do? How do you know that this is, I don't, it's just difficult. It's just, at the end of the day, it's difficult to just wrap it all up into one. It's just a broad, and that's all I have to say. Great, thank you, Leandra. Amanda, Mindy had over here. Mindy, do you wanna raise your hand so she can find you? Hi, I have a 16-year-old um, who's been on corticosteroids for can you say your name and where you're from? For Mindy the Cameron from Indianapolis, Thank Indiana. You. My son is 16, almost 17, and has been on corticosteroids for 13 years. And I think anybody with long-term steroid can't ignore the fact that you get a almost a secondary condition from the side effects of the steroids, especially the bone health. We are terribly afraid of fractures. 
I feel, you know, we're, we're manually transferring him a lot and I feel like I could break him in half sometimes because his bones are so fragile now. So I think um, that in itself is almost a co-occurring condition now for us. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, and then we'll do one more back here, right behind you, Amanda, if you can turn around. Oh, sorry, Ryan, and then we'll go to Ryan. Yeah. Hi, my name is Limka Javeri. Uh, my son is six, and um, we don't have an official diagnosis in terms of behavior, but we are getting a neuromuscular assessment, a neuropsychological assessment. He does, I think, suffer from ADHD, a little bit of mild anxiety, um, some OCD-like traits. Um, he just fractured his arm two weeks ago, um, and he got surgery, and you know, the first thing he said, because of the mild anxiety, he's like, I don't wanna go to school with a, with a cast. Anytime there's weather changes, he talks about the weather and the storm coming, when is it gonna stop? So he does have those components, and now, because of the fracture, he's having bone loss. He's been on steroids since he was four and a half, and he's sick, so it's only been a year and a half, and he's already having bone loss. Um, so that's another factor that's kind of, um, we did luckily, with all the behavior issues, um, get him into a clinical trial. Um, screening was tough, um, but my husband and I had to really coach him and kind of you know, tell him that you need to understand, that you need to um, go through all of these screening trials. And you know, it's, it's difficult, every visit is difficult, but he gets through it. Um, but it is a lot on us. Um, again, we don't have an official diagnosis, but we do think there's other things going on. Thank you. Okay, and we'll do one last on this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. Hi, um, my name is Rhiannon Ramkasoon. I'm from Reno Valley, California, and I have a 14-year-old son named Carter. Um, Carter actually has a diagnosis of Becker, but um, he was very ill from the time he was born. Um, he had emergency surgery. He had an ileal atresia. Um, he spent his first month fighting for his life in the NICU. Um, from then, it was kind of just a, he's going to be okay, we're gonna get past this, and then we would have another diagnosis come up. He's growth hormone deficient. He has anaphylactic food allergies. Um, he has eosinophilic esophagitis as well, which really limits what he's able to eat. Um, but for us, with all of the compounding things and him being so ill from the time he was little, it really made it hard for us to narrow down a diagnosis because he was so sick, he appeared like he was more as Duchenne, and it was actually some of these other things coming into play. Um, so it's been really hard for us to navigate what it is, which issue it's coming from, those types of things, and navigating how to balance everything um, within the complexity of having multiple rare diagnoses. So it's just been you know, very difficult to make those decisions being you know, we're all so individual cases, but having nobody else with this, these combinations, so it can make things really, really hard. And we don't fit into any box, we don't fit into any trials, so, you know, we try to be involved and do natural history, but that's really all we can do. Thank you. So this next question, so one of the things about doing this meeting was we were really struck by, we had, you know, our set questions, and as the panelist testimony came in, we really revised those questions based on some of the themes coming from the testimony. And so this is one of those questions, because we were really struck by um, how detailed the testimony was around talking about specific activities that you recognized in your children that were difficult, that really lended themselves to the potential for outcome measures or things that could be measurable that could be integrated into clinical trials and clinical development. And so this question is around that. So if you could just spend a few minutes thinking about it. are there specific activities, and this is for everybody, and we could start with the panel, that are important to you and your child that your child cannot do or at all or is fully and would really like to do to do Shen. And so think about things such as, and we've heard about the four-wheeler, which is a really great example, or activities, specific activities with peers, or stairs, or bike riding. And as you think about that, do you consider those to be subtle, or do you consider, consider them to be measurable? So are they things that only you're noticing, or that others might notice that there are limitations in those activities? So we'll start with the panel because they knew that question was coming, and we'll give others um, a few minutes to think about it. 
Um, so when I think about the things that Henry would like to do, I think that he would love to be able to ride his bike. Um, he has a he has a bike that was adapted for him, but he's still not able to like propel it enough to be able to go up any kind of incline. And so, and it, it even has like some kind of motor. I don't really know how it works, but it's supposed to help help him keep going. And so if he could do that, that would be so nice to do. And so can I a ask walk. a follow up question? Is this like a big wheel where he's seated and the pedals are in front of no. him or like a tricycle where the pedals it's are a, below him? It's a, um, it's like a giant size tricycle, I guess. So okay. it's, it's like an adapted bike. Okay. So, so that would be, that would be amazing. I think. Okay. Lisa? Um, I would say... Can you pull on mic one sorry. of the microphones close to you? Um, I would say one that sticks out in my mind. Uh, my guy is six. And trampolines. Trampolines are no-no. Um, and it's hard to explain to him, you know, that you can't, you know, it's going to cause more damage to your muscles. It's, it's not good for you at all. And his friends are, you know, having birthday parties. And... They're having bounce houses, and they're having it at a trampoline, you know, indoor trampoline place, and we can't do that. It's Can I, just, and a follow-up question to that, with related to the trampolines, is it the difficulty with jumping, the fear of bone fracture? What is it about the tramp? All of it? Just, yeah, like for me, it's it's the muscle damage that's going to be taking place. It's so hard. Okay. The eccentric, he, and exercise. he wants to jump. Like he can't, Lane can't jump, okay. and you know, I mean, he wants to. Even like when he's doing his uh, aquatic therapy, you know, he's in the pool. That gives him a little bit more freedom, and he wants to jump so bad. Okay, All right, Jess. I, there's many things that I think Connor would like to do, but I, I think the one thing would be to be able to take the stairs on the bus. You know, um, he does have to take the bus, and he has a, um, a monitor carrying him off, and everybody sees that. As much as they try to hide, you know, they try to be the first bus or the last bus or get everybody else off first, and it's really embarrassing for Connor. Um, and he says everybody asks him why, and, you know, I try to give him the tools to answer um, age appropriately, and everybody's different, and your muscles are different, you know? I stopped using the word special because I love that word and they're not special muscles. They're different and everybody's different. So I really think that his whole day is at times impacted because of being so embarrassed, not, not, not using the stairs, you know, um, on the playground too. He, you know, sees everybody else playing. It's hard. I can agree with that, Jess, because I, I think if friending could change anything, it would be why am I the only one who has to have somebody help me up the stair or, you know, catch me at the bottom of the slide? And he's starting to recognize that, that he's the one child in all of first grade who needs that assistance. Um, and he so longs to be the quarterback. He just wants to be the quarterback, but recognizes that he can't duck out of the way. And, I mean, he knows he would get sacked every time, and he just, you know, can't maneuver himself out of the way. So, and I would wish that for him, not to be sacked every time, but to, you know, be, able to, <laughs> to be the quarterback. <laughs> Just making sure I'm clear on that. <laughs> All right. Um, maybe if there are one or two in the audience that want to add to it. Angela, over here. Ryan, Angela. Thanks. I'm Angela Knight. I'm from Westminster, Colorado, and Jack is 17, but um, you guys are kind of talking about what the kids want to do when they were younger. When Jack was younger, one of the things I really wanted him to do was be able to sit in the classroom and not be fatigued and not be cramping and be able to stay and focus in the classroom and sort of take all of that and be a, be a part of the classroom in a way that he wasn't you know, he'd slide off his chair because his legs hurt or he'd have to move or fidget and those kinds of things. And um, it would be really nice if they didn't have to have these other disruptions when they're trying to participate in the classroom with the other kids. That's great. Oh, yes. I agree with that, Angela. Just that I feel sometimes that Lane comes home frustrated because he wants to play with his friends. His friends are over here playing with blocks and stuff. And I feel that his therapists do, in the school, do a nice job of 
you know, integrating his friends into the play, so it's not so much of an interruption. But I feel that he's frustrated too, because you know, here comes the OT and PT. I want to play with my friends. You're making me stop what I'm doing so that because we have to, you know, focus him on, you know, and work extra hard to get these other tasks done. So, okay, great, Kelly. We're shifting down here. People are looking around the room. So the one day that we hate, uh, the one school day we hate every year is field day. Can yeah. we? Yeah. Probably all in agreement that yeah. um, it's the kids' funnest day of the year, and it's the day that uh, is so heartbreaking. It's a, it's just heartbreaking to watch. Great. Okay. And then well, Rasha, one last, and we'll wait for the camera to come over right here in the aisle. Um, Re my name is Resha. I live in New York. Um, my son Bazi is four, and this is not answering your question exactly, Annie, but what I want him to do, what I'd like for him to do, is to be able to evacuate a building in case of fire, mm -hmm. and he can't. That certainly answers the question, Rasha. Okay, so let's... M is there one more? Yep. We'll do one more. Oh, Ryan, second row right here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ethan Marquez. I'm from Santa Clarita, California. Um, my son Peyton is 12. I think that um, uh, you can, as parents of a child with Duchenne, we sit here and listen to the, the panel, and I think we all sit there and shake our heads, yes, we, we are all going through the same things, and I don't know if our federal partners here or the people that are the federal partners understand that all of us are going through the same thing. And, and one of the things that happens when we're, anytime I'm just, we're deciding if our son is going to do something, it's a cost versus benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. We're basically weighing the costs of him never participating in any functions yeah. versus there's a risk to participate in the functions which could sideline him, break a bone, do something that he'll never be able to, and it'll start a, a downhill spiral for him health-wise. Um, and it's, it's a constant, just a judgment call, and you're hoping you're making the right decision because you don't want your child to be left behind and never participate and live in a bubble, but you want him to experience life. Mm -hmm. And every single thing that everybody has said here, I can say, yeah, that's, uh, we do the same thing, bouncy houses, OCD. Um, and as far as just our children out in public, um, I can think of all kinds of things where my son uses a mobility scooter at school and dealing with the school and the issues with that. Um, I, I, people will make comments when they're in the airport looking at my son, why are you, like, he's in a scooter. I've, people have made comments, hey, you're not supposed to be riding your grandma's scooter around. I mean, this is the kind of things that are happening as, as families, and everybody can shake their head and go, yeah, that's, we, yeah we've all experienced that. So, um, but like I said, it's, it's basically everything that happens is a cost versus benefit analysis that you're making in life for your child. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's shift into talking about um, the current treatments and then clinical trials. And so... Let's start with again with the panel, and you don't all necessarily have to answer it, but and then move into the audience for this one. Um, and again, some of you spoke about this, and Nate, I was particularly struck by how you talked about this in your testimony. But <clears throat> having young kids with Duchenne today is very different than you know for the adults who were in the room what it was like for them when they were three, four, and eight. The what what they take in the morning at breakfast, right, mm -hmm. is different. So can you talk a little bit about what the most significant downsides to your current treatments are and how they affect your child's daily life? And not just necessarily the um, therapies that you, the oral therapies that you take, but the impact on your school and community and the activities that you participate in with clinical regimens that you participate in or participation in clinical trials or decisions about clinical sites that you may travel to. Can you just talk to the point about that benefit-risk decision-making that you're making as you look at your therapeutic options? Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I could just say that, you know, Connor, we started, um, we didn't want to put Connor on steroids 
um, weighing that long list of horrible side effects, like someone said in the audience, with a, another whole host of, of problems. So we went the route. We decided to try an alternative. And it was, um, it's still in trial right now. We, we were very happy with this. And Connor's now approaching the age where, you know, like, should we keep going with this? It's not approved yet. We can't get into any other trials being on this drug. So we, we dropped out. And it was probably the, one of the most painful things at this point in my life, besides the diagnosis, that putting, uh, deci you know, deciding to drop out and put it, putting Connor on, on steroids daily. And so um, there's no way to get into any other trial without being on a daily dose of steroids. So I felt like I didn't have a choice. So that's something that, you know, we decided to do. And there are a lot of trials out there. And I think Annie and I were talking last night, and she remembers the first conference four years ago or whatever. And I said, look at all these trials. I just don't know which one to pick. We don't know what to do. And, it's, and I felt bad saying it to parents who didn't have those choices, right? But you get in these trials, and then you don't even know if the drug is working and can't find any data. You just have to kind of watch your kid and, you know, see if, is it working? I don't know. And there's other opportunities that go by, and then there's washout periods and all of that, and it's, it's tricky and um, it's, it's really tough. So. Thanks, Jess. Anybody else want to on the panel? Um, for us, it, it's been a complex journey. And I shared earlier, Brendan has a bunch of different um, medical issues that come along with Duchenne. So that decision making process, some of it was easy because those other things excluded him from certain trials. And um, you know, finally, when we, we picked one that we thought was great for him, especially dealing with a growth hormone deficiency, knowing steroids probably was not the best route for us to go at this time. Um, that kind of helped me, made it easier to go with a steroid alternative. Um, but I will tell you, we live in Central Florida, and the site for this trial started in Portland, Oregon. So we were going back and forth from one corner of the country to another, but weighing that benefit risk, um, we want to do what's best for our son and give him every, every chance that he has, so. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Anybody else on the panel? Okay, why don't we open it up to the floor? Anyone else want to talk about <clears throat> what's factored into your uh, decision making around the treatments that you've considered in the 10 and under age group? And then we can broaden that now to even decision making around clinical trials, considering that this is the age group where the, our community meets the inclusion criteria for the majority of the clinical trials available. Sorry, I feel like I'm going to talk too much. No, that's great. I'm Angela. I'm from Colorado. My son's 17. Um, we were fortunate to be in the very first trial um, for Duchenne and Adelurin. Um When we did the initial, it was 28 days. It was not a big decision to make. When we went back into the trial, it was the beginning of second grade. And um, we flew to Utah and, and then flew home, and then we were participating in the um, MRI study, and we would fly to Florida and come back, and we were doing those on um, a more than regular basis. And so we actually sat down and said, um, how important is second grade? And we decided that we were not going to put much emphasis on second grade. We were going to just say when he gets to school, he gets to school. When he participates, he participates and um, hope that what he lost by spending most of second grade traveling and in clinical trials, he'd be able to make up at a later point and kind of talk to the school and said, this is, this is the way we're approaching it. Um, what was funny was the things that really were an issue during that time were flying during the Valentine's party. We'd have, you know, he hated missing those kinds of things. So when we, we decided to write off the education part of second grade, <laughs> such, <laughs> such great parents, what, what really uh, duh, was a problem was, you know, the, the Valentine's party, the holiday parties, all the things that they did. Um, but, you know, as parents, you, you're making hard decisions. And that's, that's one of the ones that, you know, comes to mind when we're talking about younger kids, is how much school, how much education, how much are they missing? Now, he's 17. He's doing great in school. 
He's doing great on the drug. Everything's Wait, good. Save the rest of that answer for the, the next panel. Nope, that's good. You're going to, down a <laughs> but, good path I mean, for the next panel. Sorry. Yeah. Nope, that's good. That was good. And so as we're expanding to the others who are going to answer this question, also be thinking about as you're factoring in these considerations around treatments or trials and sort of qualify that when you're answering. And let's leave the products that you're participating. If you're talking about a trial, let's not talk about which trials. But also think about what were some of the things that are factoring in that are important to you, proximity to home, the duration of the trial. You don't, if that wasn't your answer, don't worry about it. Um, but then also if there's an extension available, so let's layer that in as people are starting to answer questions. Yep, go ahead. Am I talking? Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm Perlita Haynes. I'm from Lebanon, Pennsylvania. And my son Levi um, is 11. And he's been um, in a trial for a few years now. And I think the impact on us, of course, is Levi. But we have two older siblings. They're 18 and um, 15. So working around the trials, you know, we're fortunate that the trial site is about two hours from our home. And it's a drivable two hours. So we're fortunate. But the impact it has on the siblings and missing a lot of their events and, you know, they're pretty active and, you know, we don't want to forget them, but Duchenne does seep into all of our lives. So I think thinking about that trial, of course, we want our little guy to um, be a part of that and, of course, you know, be involved in a trial, but it does take a toll on the siblings and, and the other part of your, your family. Yeah, very good. Yeah. I, Lisa, I kind of just wanted to speak to that too. Um, part of the consideration for us, you know, our family is really young right now. Um, my daughter is starting to get into different activities of her own. And, you know, for me to consider some of these trials where it would be, I mean, there's, it's travel for us from where we are to get to a trial site. And, you know, we have to consider. I missed my I missed Wyatt's third birthday because to come to this and that's that's the kind of things that we do we we miss those things you know be, for the greater good but it's it's still you know you have to pick and choose and mm -hmm. and it's hard to miss out on those activities and consider okay if we're traveling every week to a clinical site what am I going to miss you know I'm going to miss my other two kids growing up and you know that's that's part of that's part of it it weighs heavy Yep, let's do one more. Yep. Hi, my name is Joanna Johnson. I'm from Downingtown, Pennsylvania. I have two boys with Duchenne. Uh, Elliot is 14 and Henry is 11. And as a, as a parent with two kids with Duchenne, I think um, that starts to become difficult when you're deciding on a clinical trial. If one child qualifies and the, others, the other does not. Uh, we were in a situation uh, where my, uh, when they, they were diagnosed uh, almost in 2007, um, and uh, my oldest was eligible for a clinical trial. My youngest was too young, and, um, and, it, and it took some time until um, he was eligible to try to qualify for the trial, and he walked too fast um, to be able to be included. So you end up in this Sophie's Choice position as a parent of, uh, what do I do? You know, which which child do you decide? So I think that's that's something I'm grateful for companies that that offer sibling access now. But um, you know that that's a really important point to consider for some who have multiple children with Duchenne. Yes, thank you, Joanna. So we're we're going to leave on one last question, and I'm going to ask everyone on the panel to answer it. Um, is what are you most hopeful about as you look to the future for your child? Um, I'm most hopeful and looking forward to watching Henry grow up because he's hilarious, he's really smart, and um, he's a good friend to people. And I am looking forward to seeing um, what he brings into this world as an adult. And not to leave my Lucy behind because she's a force of her in her own right as well. And so I feel hopeful for my family. I know I sounded really upset, and I am upset and, you know, regarding my testimony. But we have so much to be thankful for and grateful for. And I just, you know, I feel so lucky that I am, that I have this family and that I have my, um, my Henry and my Lucy and my amazing husband who, who helps drive all of this for us. I'm most hopeful 
for a bright future for all of our boys. Um, Brendan's a great kid too. He asks a lot of questions, um, a lot of questions sometimes I can't give the answers to. But he talks about growing up, and right now he thinks girls are gross. But, you know, his sister reminds him, you're not going to always think like that, Brendan. You know, he talks about being a dad, and he mm. talks about bringing his kids to Disney someday. And I glow, but my heart breaks at the same time. So I am hopeful for effective treatments in his lifetime, and in a timely manner. You know, he's seven years old. He's seven years old, so our clock is ticking, and I just am hopeful that um, you know, he'll be on the winning end of that timeline. I remember when I was in fifth grade uh, in Michigan, um, Magic Johnson, the superstar basketball player, came out and um, made public that he was HIV positive. And I remember thinking that, oh my goodness, Magic Johnson is going to die in a year or less. Like, he is so sick. And that was a long time ago. Um, probably almost 25 years ago. And I feel as if the hope that my wife Sarah and I have is maybe somewhat similar to the HIV AIDS space. You know, um, what the diagnosis meant, you know, 30 years ago or 20 years ago is very different than what it means today. So, um, yeah, we try to be hopeful that um, Andrew will live a long life and will walk until he breathes his last breath, and hopefully that's uh, a lot of years after Sarah and I are gone. Um, we hope he outlives us, and um, we hope he has a family, and uh, yeah, we just, uh, we surrender him to whatever it may be. So one of the things that I feel, I guess, looking forward, um, just as time goes on, you know, if we do nothing for, you know, for Lane or kids like Lane, even that have Duchenne, you know, we see, you know, the increase in care that's required as time goes on. Um, and, you know, I would say that my hope is that, you know, impacts our entire family. You know, there are days where I feel like, what would I be doing? What, what would I be doing if I, you know, I have dreams and goals that I've had to put on hold because of Duchenne, you know, and that don't revolve around Duchenne. And that's how I feel that we are right now. But, you know, that hopefully someday we can, you know, we can, it doesn't have to revolve around Duchenne. Mm -hmm. And that we can, So I'm hopeful for a lot. I never thought I'd say this, but I'm hopeful that, I hope, I'm hopeful for Connor to come home from college and dump his dirty laundry. <laughs> and I can wash it, you know how crazy that is. Oh, my kid's home from college. I have hopes that people might take for granted, but I'm very hopeful. Um, and my husband and I always say, you know, Connor could live a great life. He could still be a chef. He wants to be a chef if he's in a wheelchair. Um, but one thing, yeah, I hope Connor can, um, can always hug me um, and smile, because they can lose that too. There's muscles everywhere, so I'm, I'm hopeful for a lot for Connor, but um, I'm hopeful that he keeps hope, and I hope we do a good job instilling that in him. So, thanks. All right, I think we should thank our panel and thank you to everyone who participated.